Hello everyone and welcome. This is Brenda Haug and I'll be facilitating today's session, Basic PC Troubleshooting. Before we dive into the content, let's cover some technical information. The tool we're using for today's session is ReadyTalk. And all the lines are muted except for the presenter lines, but you can use chat to ask questions, share ideas, make comments. And a lot of you have already been chatting. And so feel free to use that throughout the session. We do have time at the end of the session set aside for questions, but please feel free to ask them at, at any point. Um, troubleshooting tips. If you, something happens on your end, your computer locks up, you stop hearing us, anything like that, the number one troubleshooting tip is to um, sign out or close out and then go back to the email with the registration information and come back in again. So that's number one troubleshooting tip, um, tip is to try that. This session is being recorded, and later today we're going to send out a follow-up email, and that will include a link to the recording. It will include a copy of the slides that we're using today, and any resources that we talk about will include web links for those too. So don't worry about needing to write down web addresses when we talk about resources. We'll include those in the follow-up email. Okay, well with that let's move on to our content for the day, Basic PC Troubleshooting. And I'm joined today by Joe Olivar who's at the Washington State Library. Joe, do you want hello. to say hello? How you all doing? Good. Glad to have you here. Are you in Olympia, Joe? I am. Well, you Tumwater, are. technically Tumwater, yeah, but most people would recognize Olympia. Okay. And then we have a couple of people who won't be um, talking, but who are helping out in the tech in the chat, and that's Stephanie Girding, and then also Sarah Washburn, both from TechSoup. They're helping out with the chat. So again, as you have questions or comments, feel free to put them there, and um, we'll be watching for those. So this is a, a TechSoup webinar, and if you're interested in learning more about computers, learning more about technology, TechSoup is a great resource. It's one of the addresses that I'll share in that follow-up message today. But the site has articles, a community forum where people post questions about technology. And if you haven't heard of the technology donation program, you'll definitely want to explore that. So that's one resource already. And if you have, um, haven't been to the TechSoup site in a while, you should check it out. It recently underwent a, a major remodel, and, and it looks good. So TechSoup.org, and again, don't worry about writing it down. We'll include that in the follow-up <coughs> message. There's a special section of TechSoup that's for libraries, TechSoup for libraries. And it's focused on libraries and technology. And in the follow-up message, I'll include a, a link to that section too. Today's webinar is one of a series of webinars we're doing in support of the Library Edge Initiative. And the EDGE Initiative, it's a coalition of library and government organizations that are working to develop tools to continuously, or to support libraries in continuously improving public technology. And one of the tools that's being developed is benchmarks. And um, they look at things like practices, policies, equipment, staffing. There are 11 benchmarks, and today's webinar is based on number 10, maintaining technology. And in the follow-up email, we'll include a link to that too. So some good resources to know about, things that have lots of helpful follow-up information. But with that, I think we're ready to, to hear a little from Joe. I'll let you introduce yourself more completely, Joe. All right. I'm Joe Olivar. I'm out of Tumwater, as I said earlier. I've been doing IT for a number of years, uh, most of it uh, surrounding libraries. Uh, I did uh, in main support for all the institutional libraries in the state, uh, mostly on the west side though. I had a counterpart on the east side of the state. Uh, but we did, we went everywhere. And, um, and then here in Tumwater is the main state library in which I was tech support here, uh, doing desktop and network support for a number of years. But I am currently uh, with the web development team now, or excuse me, the tech development team. And um, we're here, and it brings me to you now. I went out and did some uh, 
PC troubleshooting classes for the rural libraries. And recently, well, not recently anymore, it was last year, uh, did one for the Whale Conference. And so here I am today. Okay, great. Well, we're glad to have you here. And just to reiterate, today's session is really intended to be basic, so those who have little to no experience troubleshooting a Windows PC, that's, that's what we're, our target audience is for this. Okay, well Joe has a number of tips that he's going to share with us. And remember, feel free to ask questions at any time. Use the chat for that, and we'll be tracking those questions. And um, with that, should we go ahead and jump right into the first tip? All right. Get familiar with the basic components. That is so true. Um, if you were working on your car and didn't know what you were working on, uh, you would be putting an alternator where it shouldn't go, and so forth, and et cetera. Same thing here. It's like any piece of machinery. The more you know about it, the more you can talk with the person. If, if you went to a car um, repair shop, you have an idea of what they're trying to tell you so you can converse and um, adequately de describe what issues you're having. Same thing with the PC. So on this page, um, everybody take a look at it. See. Go through the list, and I know it says uh, if you opened up the PC, three of those items are actually not inside, and I'm sure you can pick those up pretty easily. But take a look at them, and uh, just think about it, and we're going to come back to it, but I want you to take a look at them first, and just see how many you can identify. And then we'll actually poll you, and. Um so actually count how many you, you feel like if you opened up the computer you could identify. And we have a poll. We'll give you just a couple of minutes. I see people weighing in there. All right. Okay, we'll close the poll in three, two, one. So four to six wins. Four to six wins, yeah. But we have people really all across the board too. Some people yes. who feel more zero to three, and then a lot in four to six. Okay, so. Yeah, I'm so. curious. It looks like um, Stephanie posted in the chat that Tanya said everything except the I.O. interface. I was going to so identify the that. <laughs> yes. um, that is actually probably what you're most familiar with. You just don't know it by that name. Um, if you go to a computer and you've ever put one together before, when you plug into the back, that is the I.O. interface. I.O., all that means is simply in and out, inbound, outbound. That's all it really means. And so we, we have this nice way of making things look really confusing when they're not. Um, but yep, yeah, there you go. There's a picture of one right there. So if you look at that, most of that stuff is recognizable to you. Um, place to put your uh, monitor, hook up your monitor, hook up your USB, hook up your sound, your network, um, your, your mouse or your keyboard. It's all pretty much there. And um, really, there's not much to it when you stop and think about what you're plugging into. And most of the cables, and we'll call them device cables, um, because they connect devices, and, but they'll, like your VGA cable is your main one that you use to hook up a monitor. That will go in, oh, let me find my little blue arrow here, or my little arrow here. Right there, hopefully everybody can see that. Most people have uh, hooked up a monitor before. And that is your, where you would hook it up. This is your more modern um, DVI for more modern monitors. Um, but uh, you'll still see a lot of this VGA connection. Now, calling it a device cable is just a generic way of saying that it hooks up to device. Other people will call it a VGA cable or a monitor cable. But, uh, there you go, because you have your USB cables. They are technically a device cable. You'll have your um, other cables uh, to go to your, um, uh, for instance, your 
your optical one here. It's still a device cable, but it's a fiber cable, technically. So those are the things, if you're talking to somebody in, in the IT world and you're troubleshooting something, you can tell them, well, my VGA cable doesn't seem to work. Or um, when you hook up the monitor, they might ask you, is your VGA cable hooked up? And you can say, yes, it is, and you'll know what they're talking about. And you can um, identify which areas there are um, on your computer and on your monitor. Another one people are asking about is the system board and wondering if that's also called a motherboard. That is absolutely correct. And if you look at it, um, over here, that is what we were looking at just a minute ago. That is your I.O. We're looking at a top view of it, obviously. So this would be the back of the computer. And then right here is where uh, your CPU goes. Now, a lot of people consider a CPU when they talk to it. They say, well, my CPU is out. And they're re actually referring to their desktop um, or their PC. That is actually incorrect because the CPU is your central processing unit, and that is what most people would consider the brain of the operations for uh, your computer. And that is, if you ever heard of Intel or AMD, that's what they do. They make um, um, CPUs that go into this little spot here. And it's kind of hard to tell in this picture, but there are literally hundreds of little pins that your CPU has, and they fit specifically into this layout of pin configuration um, for specific CPUs. And they lock in, and then you put on a thing that's called a heat sink that goes on top of that with a fan usually. And it's all to keep the CPU cool because as it works, as it does your work, uh, it heats up. And when it heats up, it slows down. So if you keep it cool, that's how you keep your, um, your machine operating optimally. Um, so that uh, it stays happy, kind of like a car, back to the car analogy. Uh, if your radiator goes, your car goes. Same thing with this. You have to keep it cool. It, the heat sink looks just like a radiator. I mean, if you looked at one without knowing what it really was, you would think of it as being something that cools something just by, its, by how it looks. Okay, great. One of the things Joe mentioned to me about the, the full day you know, workshops that he does on this topic where you actually take a computer apart with a group um, is how much people enjoy that session and are surprised at how it, it, kind of, it makes sense. So a resource that we're going to share with you, because of course we can't actually open a PC and get, into depth, get in depth with all of these things right now, but we're going to be sending some videos. They're from GCS Learn Free which is just a great resource for learning. Um, it's great not only for your own learning, but when you have other people you're helping as they use the PC, there are really good tutorials on a lot of topics. And um, a couple that we're going to share with you are, are actually doing that. It's a video that shows you the inside of the, of the PC and, and these same parts and some of these things that Joe has already talked about. So that will give you a chance to, to look at that information too. Okay, and before we move from the slide, I just want to point out um, one item that most people, this one right here, item 5, random access memory, most people know as RAM or memory. Um, that is something that uh, will improve your machine best. If you have a machine that's running slow or just having a hard time when you open up more than one program, it seems to really impact its, um, its, its usability, if you will. Uh, this right here, RAM, is something that will improve uh, your machine. And let's see, other things I want to point out is number four, and number ten, your drives. The hard drive is basically your file cabinet. That's where all the information that you do, that's where it goes. It goes onto your hard drive. And so if you're talking with anybody in IT, they ask um, something about, uh, it, where are you putting something, a file, if you're looking for something, and they ask about it on your hard drive, that's where they're talking about it. If they say C drive, that's where your normal um, operating system is and where most people only have the C drive. Um, it's, it's synonymous with that, basically. And your optical drive uh, is your, your CD player, your DVD player, burner. The reason I want to point these out is because these are two components that, unlike the rest of these, 10, 1 through 10, they can actually be external as well. And so, and I'm going to touch on that later on. 
Joe, maybe I'll ask a couple of the questions that we've received that, that fit right here. Um, one question is about the difference between USB 2.0 and USB 3.0. Is that Basically, that's speed. Anytime with all this computer upgrades and as computers improve, everything is surrounding speed. Is how fast can it go so that you can do your thing better? How, how much better can it operate so you can see your video games better and not have any junky moves and the graphics are great and all that. That's all about speed. The same is applied here with your USB. Your standard USB runs at about, or excuse me, your USB 2 runs at about 400 megabits. Not that that really means anything, but your 3 is just a step up from that. I want to say it's like 600, somewhere around there. I, I forget the exact number actually. But that's what it is. And anytime you see anything like that where it says USB 2, USB 3, uh, your hard drives for instance, um, they now go by an identifier of SATA, which is, just means that it's a serial type based interface, um, and that's for transmitting data. Earlier, a few years ago, it was SATA 1, then it was SATA 2, now it's SATA 3, and it's on, and it's keep going up. And every time you see an, a number indicator that goes up, that's what they're talking about. They're talking about the next generation. This next generation is faster. Okay, great. And then another question is about um, the fan and the CPU. Um, so okay. Can the, if, let's see, it, I think the question is if the fan does not work right, can that totally damage the CPU? Yes. Most operating systems though, and most uh, components within the uh, um, the BIOS, actually, that's something we don't need to talk about. <laughs> but in any okay. case, it protects the, the CPU, your processor, from overheating on its own in that when it gets to a certain temperature, it just simply says, I quit, and your system will shut down. And that is to protect the CPU, which is the most vital, critical component on your board. Uh, and so if the fan stops working, it can no longer cool that CPU. And so what you will likely experience first is your machine starts running sluggish. Your other fans may try to compensate and start revving up and things like that. And so if, you're, if you know that the CPU fan has quit, and we're talking about the fan that actually sits physically on top of the heat sink. Remember what I was saying earlier, you had from your system board, you put on your processor in that little square area, and on top of that goes the, what's called the heat sink that looks like a radiator. And on top of that heat sink is a fan, and that is the CPU fan. And that part, when it goes, um, if it is no longer working, I would highly, and you know that for a fact, I would highly suggest you shut your machine off and don't run it anymore until you get that fixed. Okay. Well, I think that a great comment in the in the text chat from Trisha Perry who said that she learned by, there's a company they contract with for um, the tech stuff that she can't take care of and the guy that they send teaches her by letting her take it apart and put it back together. So I think Well how cool is that? Yeah, that's pretty great. Great that she has that initiative too. I, kind of, I had the same experience of the way I learned about this was um, working at a rural library in Minnesota and having a couple of computers that kept um, having issues. And so tech support would have me on the phone and would be talking me through it. So I right kind of on. unwillingly <laughs> had the same introduction to to and, hardware. And, and what I really go, – go ahead. Oh, Joe. I'm sorry. I was just going to say in your scenario, by knowing these components, that really helps because as the person on the other end of the phone is talking with you and describing what you need to do, you have a better idea of what they're talking about and saying, or, or you know, asking the questions, is this the thing with the little fins that look like mm -hmm. a radiator? You know, you already know. And yeah. so when you get to know your components, you're able to converse more, you know, fluidly with the person on the other end of the phone or whatever, and so that you can come to a remedy. Good. Yeah. So however you learn that, we'll send the videos, and so that will be a way to work on that. And then if you have those opportunities like Trisha to, to – have someone looking over your shoulder, or if you're more comfortable, look, even just look over their shoulder. I think that's a, a great way to get more comfortable with what those different components are and how it all fits together. Absolutely. Okay. Well, why don't we go ahead and go on to our next tip. Tip two, task manager is your friend. 
Yes, Task Manager. Um, this is the it's a native software program, I should say, um, that comes with Windows. Uh, the one you're looking at here in this example is actually from Windows XP. And to get to it is what that Control plus Alt plus Delete um, is telling you. If you hold down starting with the Control key, then hit your Alt key, then your Delete key, you'll get a window that pops up. Most of you have probably done this before because that is somehow that is how some people um, log out. They'll do that because you can, it can get to your logout screen. It can also get to your lock screen. But within that, there should be, depending, um, depending on where you're at, some machines won't let you get into the task manager, and, and you'll know it by doing this. You do the Control-Alt-Delete. One of the buttons is grayed out, the task manager button. That means um, your IT department has locked it down so that you cannot get into the task manager. Um, but another way of getting into the task manager is to, down in the taskbar, down in the bottom when you open up programs, you know how you, uh, the programs populate the bottom, and you can, uh, you'll have your Windows and your PowerPoint or whatever, and all start populating the bottom. That is the task, um, the taskbar area. If you go into a, a non, <laughs> an open area of the taskbar, right-click on that, you'll also have the task manager option on that. Uh, you'll get a little a menu that pops up, and you'll be able to select task manager and get to it from there as well. This is when we wanted to see if this was something that people were already familiar with, if you'd use Task Manager. A lot of yeses. Is, I like that. Is this new? No. Okay. <clears throat> oh, yeses are way out in front. All right. Vast majority. Awesome. Yeah, my husband, who is not at all techni technical, this is one that he... This is his Uses number frequently. one troubleshooting tip. Yes. <laughs> it's a it good goes one. To the task manager, yeah. It's a good one. It uh, is, yeah. Okay, well, we'll go ahead and close the poll. All right. So we're just gonna we're gonna briefly touch on this. Um, what we have here, as far as the um, example given. You'll notice that there's I lost my little my little button. In the applications tab is what we're showing here. And this area here being these are all components that are opened by the user. In other words, if you open up Windows or excuse me, you open up Word, you open up PowerPoint, you open up whatever, it's all going to show here. Okay? And then over here with the status, this is what you want to look for. And what we're after here is if you run into a problem, let's say, okay, right here, this, uh, as you can see, this is Brenda's, a screenshot of Brenda's task manager. <laughs> um, she opened up, she has a Word document open. It's a brand new one, and you can tell because this is document one. If it was one she had already opened before and, and actually saved and has reopened it, it would have a, a name right here. It would have your file name on it. But being that it's a new one, let's say she's working on it, and then um, it quits on her. She can't type. She can't close it. She goes up and tries to close the little red X on it, and it doesn't work. One thing you can do is to get into Task Manager and find out what the system thinks is happening. And over here, if it still says it's running, it just means that it's having a difficult time at the, at the current. And so just wait. If it says not responding, that means it's having issues. Still again, it might be worth it to wait. And I say that because it's trying to actually fix itself. And if you're doing something that you've worked on for the last two hours, you don't want to lose any of your work. So sometimes it's good to just let it wait, be patient, but then sometimes it just simply hung and it's not going to do any better than where it is. And so therefore, you go down to the end task here, make sure it's highlighted like this one is up here, but you would highlight this one down here, the document one, and do end task. And what it's going to do, it's basically the same thing as if clicking on this little red X. But it, it's a slightly forceful, I guess you could say. But what it's going to do, it's still going to try and save your information, at least as much as it did from the last autosave that it did. It's going to try and keep that. If it cannot, you're going to get to a point where it's going to say, do you want to force shut down? And then you say yes. And then it's pretty much guaranteed that you've lost your work at that point. If you're able to close this or highlight this and do end tasks and then it does actually close down, chances are you will have saved some of your information. So you won't have lost everything you did, 
but at least you'll have, be able to recover and go on from there. Um, the process tab, the one that's the next in line, this one right here, it has everything that's open right now, all the stuff that's running in the background and all the stuff that you have opened as well. If you close anything out of there, it, it's a kill switch. It literally, if you were to take this document, will show up in this process tab right here. If you were to kill it from the process tab, it literally kills it. There is no saving. It just, boom, it's gone. Um, the other thing in this process tab is what you have to be careful of is there are other programs in there that are running that if you accidentally kill those, you can mess up where you're at right now. Chances are if you do a restart, it will come back, but it could make things difficult for you at the time. But this performance tab is another one. This one here gives a graphic illustration, if you will, of what's going on. It will tell you what's going on with your CPU, your RAM, and that's a good one for if you're doing things and your machine starts running real slow. You can go to the performance tab and it gives you literally a bar graph that tells you um, if your CPU, your processor, is being tapped out. And if it is, then you, you know, that could be happening like if you have an older machine and you're trying to run uh, the newest suite of Adobe and um, uh, Adobe Photoshop or Creative Suite or something like that. And it's just, it's just racking on it. It's just being really hard on your CPU. That and your memory. That's another, the, the Adobe Creative Suites are very, very much uh, resource hogs, so uh, you'll probably see a big hit on your memory as well. And so those, that's a place to go so you can find out what's happening with your machine. If it's just normal stuff, if you have a bunch of programs open, and it's not so much your CPU that's being tapped, you'll probably see that your memory is being tapped and saying, in other words, um, it's going to have a measurement of how much memory you have on your machine, and it's going to tell you how much you have left to use. And it's going to give you a, a, an idea of whether or not you need to get more memory if you're going to continue on with the kind of operation you're doing at that time. If you're working under your normal capacity uh, and it's not playing friendly with you because of the memory issue, I would suggest you um, look into getting more memory and that should help you. Okay. Um, one question we got about Task Manager is um, what if it doesn't work? What if you get to the point where you know you, you you talked about ways we can use task manager to troubleshoot, but what if you you can't get task manager to work? What do you do at that point? Um, do you mean as in it's locked down so you can't get yep. to it? Won't work kind of thing? Or I think more it's not doing the job that you can't even get that to respond, or you can't get it. Well, to you come know out. that is very true. That is very true. Um, your end task on your um, applications tab there. A lot of times you will find that that. Um, You'll click on it and you'll think it's not doing anything. It actually is, and you, sometimes you just have to have patience and wait. But really, you're at the point where you only have the only other option is to log out and to force it to shut down that way, or to do an actual restart of your machine. And so, unfortunately, you're at the point where you know patience is a virtue. Um, go get a cup of coffee, <laughs> watch the latest episode of something you missed. <laughs> but um, um, yeah, that is very true. Um, that's obviously from someone who's tried it before and, and ended up hitting that brick wall. I have to admit, Task Manager, um, the end tasks function, does sometimes hang as well. But that is your best bet to try and hopefully save um, what you've been working on. But obviously okay. if it's like Internet Explorer or something like that, you ain't saving nothing there anyway. So, mm -hmm. And that you shouldn't have much trouble with as far as end tasking. One of the resources that we're going to send out is, um, it's actually from the, this is part of Windows, Microsoft Windows, and so the, the Microsoft website has a pretty in-depth overview of Task Manager and what all of these different parts are. Because I realized as you were going through this that I have certain things I use it for, but there's some, there's more that I could be doing. So good. Thanks for that overview. Okay. Should we go ahead and go on to number three? Sure. Okay. All right. And that pretty much says it all. No sounds, no lights, no nothing. So you've come in first day on Monday, first day of the week, and uh, you turn your machine on, and 
you think it's kicked on and you're waiting, and then you realize there's nothing on the screen and there's no lights on your computer. There's, it's not making the usual whiz-bang sounds um, of the fans kicking up and everything. This is, uh, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, this is your probably where you begin to think um, something's really terrible wrong. Uh, your first your first inclination is, oh my gosh, you know, call IT right away or call somebody who cares. Um, what happens most of the time is during the night, your um, uh, someone has come in and and done some cleaning around your cubicle and turned your search your search suppressor off, and so everything that's plugged into it won't come on. It's amazing how simple a thing that your machine will be or your um, issue will be when you just start following cables and just start thinking, well, let's start from square one. So first thing to do, as it says, check the power, the surge suppressor. Run the, find your power where it, clicks or where it hooks into the back of your computer. Run it back to make sure that it's in a surge suppressor. That's a hard word for me this morning. Your surge suppressor is something you should have too, I want to point out. If you do not have one, get one. Um, it's the best thing for um, preventing your machine from getting fried when you have a power surge, um, whether it be from lightning or someone hitting the telephone pole down the road. It helps protect your, it helps protect your gear. Um, in any case, so everything should be plugged into your surge suppressor, your, um, your monitor, your computer mostly. And so follow it back. See is if there's other things that are plugged into that, do they come on? Well, if they don't, well, then that's a pretty good indicator that either your surge suppressor is kicked. In other words, um, most of them have a fault in there, and if they got a power surge over the night or through the night, um, they'll they'll kick and then they'll turn itself off. And so there might be a reset button, and so you look for the reset button and hit that reset button. First, you turn it off. There should be a switch on it. Turn it off. Find the reset button. Hit the reset button and turn it back on. And if the lamp that was plugged into it now comes on, well, you know you should be able to turn your PC back on. Follow it back. Swap out the cable. If that doesn't work, it's very, very unlikely that it's going to be your power cable. Okay. Um, I have, out of all these instances like this where someone has called up and says it won't come on and I've gone back, it has always been either the power or, like the next bullet, it's been the bad processor or, excuse me, power supply unit. Um, that is almost always the case. It's one of those two things. I can't remember when it has actually been um, a cable, a power cable, but I'm, I know that as far as uh, online, you find that it has been. But the reason why that is there is just to help emphasize how important it is to swap things out. And we're gonna, I'm going to harp on you guys with swapping things out. Um, because that is the best troubleshooting tool you have when it comes to physical things. Um, but as far as that, so you've gone into it, you've gone, there's no power, your search pressure's on, you, your lamp that's plugged into it's working, you still got no power on your, on your, um, on your computer. Then, like it says, it's most likely either your bad power supply in it or the system board. So at that point, you call your IT. Um, it could also be the power switch on your, on your, um, machine. Uh, that, I have seen that happen before too, uh, but 90% um, of the time it's the power supply unit um, when you're in this scenario. And something like that, I don't, there is a test for it, but I'm not going to tell you because I don't want anybody to get curly hair when they don't need it. <laughs> um, but in any case, the other thing I want to point out on this is, okay, so you got all this going, you got your power supply, or excuse me, your computer up and running, but you have nothing on your screen, on your monitor, your, your monitor's dead. Same, same scenario here. Start looking at the cables, following the cables back. Make sure that your cables are plugged in all the way. Your power one first. If your monitor is not showing anything, but your monitor has a light on it showing that it's got power, make sure that, remember I talked earlier about the VGA cable? Um, that is your, your device cable for your monitor. Make sure that is plugged in all the way. Follow it into the monitor itself. Follow it all the way back into your um, into the computer where it's connected. Make sure that it's securely seated where it's supposed to be. Um, if all those things check out and you're still not getting um, a display on your monitor, it's either one of two things. It's either the monitor itself or it's the cable. Start with the easy one. Find yourself a, a known good working uh, monitor cable if you can. Swap that out. Still nothing if you can swap out your monitor. Swap that out. 
you know. Um, but you don't always have the luxury of having a, a working monitor laying around for you to test out, or a VGA cable, uh, or your monitor cable. So in those cases, you're kind of stuck. Then you kind of have to either call somebody uh, to come in and look at it, or you call a friend and say, hey, can I borrow your monitor? <laughs> um, um, so things like that. Um, what it boils down to is, is trace your cables. Make sure everything is connected pro properly. Connectivity is everything on these things. Even inside your machine, um, there's cables running that connect things. Um, they're, they're punched in or they're plugged into slots inside the, um, inside the computer onto the system board, to the motherboard. And so all those things, you know, things come loose. And sometimes that's all it is. It's just something's loose. And so okay. you, you follow it around, plug it back in, make sure everything's connected. If you verified all that, power, connections, so forth, et cetera, um, and you're still not getting anything, unfortunately it's time to call your IT. Okay. Good. Well, we have a couple of questions in the, tech, in the chat. Um, one of them, I think Eli made a good point that he had this problem and it turned out it was actually the outlet that was having issues. And so I think like you said, Joe, it's just really your troubleshooting is all about isolating. What is it? Is Correct. it the which piece is it that's having the issues? That's what your troubleshooting is about. Absolutely um, correct. What's your opinion on whether or not computers should be turned off every night? In back way back in the early days, we'll say, um, it used to be a big deal because because if you turned a machine on and off, it, it would suffer what's called chip creak, in which your your components would um, heat up and expand, and then as they cooled off, they would shrink, and then you end up with connection problems that are basically um, unfixable. They you'd have to replace things totally because of that, and so. Um, Nowadays, um, it's not as bad. The other thing that used to suffer, um, like in the Windows XP early in XP days, um, you would you would have problems with uh, the operating system not really come becoming corrupt, but it would mm, have things not aligned. <laughs> we'll we'll okay. go with that for lack of a better description. Um, and so you would have issues doing things, and and they would say, oh, well, restart your machine. And that's why. And it would just simply restart. Everything would get back in alignment, if you will, and everything would be fine. Turning off your machine at night, um, the only real thing you're helping is, is, is the power bill. Nowadays, the, um, your components are just fine with turning on and off. It's not a big deal. Leaving it on is not, not a big deal. The only thing you're really going to hurt um, is probably uh, if your hard drive continues to spin all night, um, if it's doing something, because um, you're wearing there's actual physical wear there uh, on the gearing, and then your monitor, um, in that you just you can just physically turn off, and so that uh, your your display lasts a little longer. Um, but really, my I I don't I leave mine on all the time to be quite okay. honest with you. Well, I think this dealing with a dead PC is you introduced us to the troubleshooting process, and then I think you had a couple more examples of the same kind of being methodical about troubleshooting. A couple more examples. And here we are, the next examples. All right, mouse or keyboard, keyboard quit working. Now that most of the time you're in the middle of something when when this happens to you. And it's always like the earlier example of you've been working on a, on a particular document for the last two hours. Um, it's always at the most in an opportune time when your mouse or keyboard quit work, quits working. Um, there again, this is where, and we're going to cover this actually when we go a little farther, but there again, it's the, it's the time to start tracing back points of contact, what's wrong, and it's going to vary a little bit with the mouse and keyboard in this situation because you have two flavors basically. Well, technically you have three flavors. You have your wired flavor, you have two flavors. <laughs> your wired connections, you have two flavors. You have your PS2, which is your little round one with, I want to say, four pins in it. And um, then you have your USB connection. Your USB connection is your friendly one, if you will, because usually on your mouse and keyboard, if, you, if they quit working, you unplug them, you plug them back in, and that's going to tell you whether or not it was just a communication error 
uh, with your machine because that's what happens normally is that your machine is quit talking with it, if you will, because um, there's, there's constant communication going on between your components. And your hardware, I mean, excuse me, your mouse and your keyboard are no different. When they're plugged into your machine and you're working on stuff, they're constantly sending information back to your machine. And your mouse um, being, you know, it has uh, your right click, left click, and then your keyboard with the, your, your lettering. Um, oh, yes, I got yakking too much and wasn't paying attention to what slide we're on. <laughs> um, did you want to go back to the one before that? Sorry about that. I, That's okay. Yeah, I told you to stop me. I, I get rambling. No, we're getting lots of good questions too, so this is good. Let's just All right. A patron is working to, uh, hard to create something, and then it quits. What's your options? What would you think you would do first? And this isn't an actual poll. This is, uh, this is just to get, a, get an idea. Most would say, um, put a sign on the computer and call IT. That's generally what happens here. Um, and that, that's, that's very logical. But if you were doing it, um, think of it as if you were doing it. What would you do? The first thing you want to do is actually A, save your work. So we can move on now. Okay. I like that guy. He's, there, there was just something really cool about him. I liked him. Um, yes, you want to save your work. And the reason I say that is because it may come down to restarting your machine or doing something like that in which you have the potential to lose your work. So chances are you, you'll, you'll be fine, but this is a good idea. This, this falls under the pretense of back up your work, which is what we're going to step into later on as well. So you're using your mouse and your keyboard quit working and all you have is mouse function. Your normal procedure is to go up and you can save, you know, um, save as if it's a new document or just click save. If you just click save, it's an, it's an existing document. It'll go back to where it was and, and it'll save in its current state. If it's a new document and you do save, you'll have to do a, it'll be a save as and you won't be able to type anything. So what you want to do is note where the location that it's, it's being directed to. You can redirect the location um, using your mouse by uh, navigating through the screen, but it's just as easy to note where it's going just so you can get on with things. So note the location and uh, note the name of the document too. Most likely if it's a new document, it's going to be document one or something to that description. And then hit the Save button. From that point, um, you can, if it's your keyboard, Keyboards don't always unplug if it's, they're the PS2 type. They don't always plug, unplug and plug back in uh, very, very readily. So at this point, not only would you do that, um, you would make sure everything is closed down and saved and log off. And if you have to, do a restart um, and using your mouse to do that and to bring your keyboard back. But that's obviously after you've checked the connection to make sure that is indeed seated properly. And if you have to, unplug it, plug it back in. Uh, sometimes uh, your, your um, PS2 type connection will work with the keyboard. Um, so we can probably go on to the next, and the next is using the keyboard. So the reverse is your mouse quit working and you need to save your work. So if you hit, um, if you hold the Alt key, which is the one directly left and right of your space bar, you hold that down and hit F4, it's going to try and close that program that is open. Whatever program is open, it's going to try and close that. If it's a program that has changes made to it, it's going to want to save it. If it is one that has already been um, saved prior, it will save it back to where um, it was before. If it is a new um, uh, document, again, note the location. You can navigate. It's a little bit cumbersome, but you can navigate to a new location. And then, but there, here you should have, it should automatically be highlighted um, in, the, in the proper space for you to name the document. So you could just name the document, uh, hit Enter, because that should, um, I say should, you may have to tab over to your um, Save button, um, and, but hit Enter, and that should save it to wherever it was that it was uh, where you noted to that location. So if I'm going to go to the next slide, um, that, this is the example of the two um, 
types of uh, connections we have. The PS2, as you see, um, the green is normally the mouse, the purple is normally the keyboard. Nowadays, you can even have some um, back to that I.O. interface. If you notice that one, I should have pointed it out, that it was half green and half blue. Most I.O. interfaces will have either green or, I said blue, green or purple um, uh, connection on there. And so it makes it easy, easy color coded. Uh, the older ones, they have a little, a little diagram so you know which one's a mouse and which one's a keyboard. But the PS2 is a little funky. It doesn't always uh, play good and play friendly with you as far as unplugging and plugging back in and expecting it to work. Sometimes once you lose the connection, lose um, or the how you say the communication um, between the system and the piece of hardware, uh, the 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 unplugging does and plugging back in doesn't always work with the uh, the PS2. The USB, on the other hand. That almost always works. If that's what the issue is, is that it's simply an, an issue where it lost its communication, by unplugging the USB and plugging it back in, we'll almost always renegotiate that communication and your two components, your, your, your computer and your, your piece of hardware, be it, the compu uh, be it the keyboard or the mouse, will um, again talk to each other and, and start playing together. All right, so we've been through most of this already. Check your connections. USB, like I said, unplug and receipt. The wireless ones, that is the third one that I mentioned, or that I did not mention earlier. And that is, a lot of times you'll learn, you'll lose a connection, and you, all you have to do is reset the connection, if you will. Most of the time, they'll have a component which plugs into the computer, and then either your keyboard or your mouse or both will use that same component. And it's a little transceiver type thing, a little uh, antenna, if you will. And on that, oftentimes, uh, it'll be, oftentimes you'll, it'll be a, a USB that you plug in on a cable, and then you'll have this little piece that'll come up and it'll sit like on your desktop. Oftentimes there's a button on that. You press that button and you get it to start searching is what you're doing. And it starts, say, it starts looking for the frequency that your mouse or your keyboard are on. And so once you press that button, it starts looking for them so that you give, them some, give it something to find on your mouse or the keyboard, whichever one isn't working. You press, there should be a button on the mouse. It's usually on the bottom and the keyboard, same way. It's usually on the bottom. And it's, it's going to be small. And sometimes it's in a, a recessed area, so you'll have to use like a, like a, a pencil or something to get in there or the uh, tip of a paper clip to push that button. And what you're doing is you're sending out, resending the signal, broadcasting to the transceiver uh, so that it says, oh, I found you, and then they reconnect and everything works fine. The other part of that is sometimes it's the batteries. Your battery just simply died. So you change your batteries out, and then you repeat the, the steps of the syncing and, and where you press the button, a uh, little button on your transceiver to get, make it look, and then you press the buttons on your um, components so that they say, hello, I'm here. And then the talking, the communication goes on, and away they go. The restart your PC, this is the drastic measure part. All right, if you're doing the keyboard, if your keyboard is the part that is working, you hit Control-Alt-Delete, and you'll have a back to that same window where you can access your um, device manager, your lock screen, and all that. There should be a restart button that you could tab over to um, or shut down. And uh, do that. This, this is your last option. Do that, and the system will shut down and restart. Your mouse, it's your, if your mouse is the thing that's working, do your normal. Go down to your Start um, button, and from there, navigate over to your Restart. If you, neither one of those work because everything is messed up and you don't have neither mouse or um, keyboard, you want to do the Power button thing. And this is definitely your last resort because this is more or less – I'm going to back that up a little bit. The quick push. There's a difference between the quick push and the hold. The quick push, if you push the power button real quick, it should simulate a safe shutdown. And the safe shutdown is the normal as if you go to your um, um, keyboard and navigate to shut down or restart. Same thing with the mouse, shut down or restart. What that does, it's going to say if there's any uh, open components right now, if any documents that are open, it's going to save those. 
It's going to try to anyway. And it most of the time will just save to its last recent save point. At that point, um, you'll go down to um, it'll it'll shut down. It'll say it'll go through its motion. And you'll see it that it's shutting down, and then it, um, once it's all the way shut down, give it a second, push the button, and restart it. The drastic measure is is the hold. Sometimes when you do the quick push, that puts it into a sleep mode. It's kind of irritating. It's kind of pointless in my point, uh, in my opinion. But um, some machines are set to go into sleep mode when you put the when you do a quick push on the button. If it does go into sleep mode, you'll probably have to wake it up, which simply means push the sleep push the button again real fast, and it'll wake it up. You'll still be in the lock position where you were. Nothing won't work but you'll have to hold it this time. So you push the button in and literally hold it for a few seconds, and your machine will shut down. You'll hear it all go, it'll all shut down. From that point, you restart it. In theory, if everything's as it should be, you're good to go. Your keyboard will work. Your mouse will work. Hopefully, you will have saved your work. You won't be out of anything. So here we are again, same thing, swap out hardware. Um, if that didn't work, you start looking for hardware that you can have that's, that you know works, swap it out. You may have to repeat some of the steps um, with your, um, like if it's a PS2, you plug it back in. If that doesn't work, if you might have to log out, log back in. Hopefully you don't have to restart. The other thing is the driver issue, that may be the issue. It's pretty rare, but it has happened, and that's usually with um, special, <laughs> we'll call them special, like your wireless keyboard and mouse, or some of your ergonomic ones that have uh, a lot of uh, um, uh, uh, extra keys that do um, tasks that you assign. Uh, those will oftentimes have drivers that you need on your machine, and sometimes they will go bonkers, and you have to reinstall the driver or update the driver. And if none of that works, we're, we're to the call IT part. <laughs> Am I? Oh man, it's already almost. Oh, I'm yakking too much. <laughs> no, you're doing well. Really. You're, we've just got one tip left. So. Okay, connectivity. Been through that. Lights, power, action. Um, that pretty self-explanatory now. No lights. It's probably power. If you get the power going, you should have action. If you don't, call your IT. Be methodical. That's what I was really trying to stress through all of this. Swap out the suspects. There you go. When you don't have, when you're at your last wit, try and swap it out to make sure that your component is indeed bad. And when you run out of those steps, time to call your IT. Sorry, I talk so much. <laughs> That's okay. No, this is great. It looks like it's helping people a lot. And the last tip has to do with the bane of many people's existence, and that is printers. And so we can't have a troubleshooting webinar without talking about printers and way to tr ways to troubleshoot the issues that happen with those? Okay. Um, I'm going to give you a quick rundown first uh, on how they work. Basically, when you press print, it sends a message to your printer, which also has RAM, which is uh, what we talked about earlier, um, uh, and the memory. And it, it sends the, the print job into the memory of the, of the printer, and the printer then, in turn, it's almost like a computer itself because it has a processor, and it says, okay, I'm ready to print that one in next in line. And it takes the information off of that and starts printing. When that goes bad, um, it can be either, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to stay on, on what we have here. Check paper tray. If you don't get a print job, oftentimes you'd be surprised how many people they just think the paper tray is always full. Because, but it's, <laughs> check that. The print queue, sometimes someone else printed, if it's on a network printer, sometimes someone else has printed something that is corrupt and it hangs up the print queue and everybody behind them gets hung up. Or your machine sent a, um, is just hung up, and so you clear the print queue. And to get to that, um, if you're on an XP machine, you go uh, your start button up to your printers and faxes, I believe it's called. Open that up, find your printer, right click on it, go to properties, and then and, and, and it'll give you a, a little thing pop up window that shows you what's in the print queue. Cancel all those, try again. That doesn't work. Sometimes there's something wrong with the printer itself in the memory. It gets the buffers get hung up. If you cycle the printer off and on, basically turn it off. Wait a second, few seconds turn it back on, it clears those buffers. Try printing again after that. 
Sometimes your settings go bonkers. Um, that's a little deep. That goes into your printers and your printing preference or your printer properties and printer preferences. You go into there and start looking in there, and it, unless you you're kind of used to that, um, you may not recognize exactly what what might be off there. But the main thing is is um, probably one to check on is the drivers on it, and eh, that's it, sometimes uh, you have to just simply switch drivers and switch them back. That'll do it sometimes. Um, but the verifying settings can be a little iffy sometimes, to be quite honest. But that is something to look at. Uh, the check connections, like I've been drilling through the whole part. Connections, connections, connections. But honestly, that has been rarely the case with uh, printer issues. And that's why it's a little lower on the list, actually. Um, these, these printers, boy, I, being from the IT doing desktop support, they are they're the ones that we spend the most time on. And so, and there you go. Try printing to a different printer if you have that capability just to make sure that there's nothing wrong with your print spooler. Um, and when it comes down to it, if all those don't work, call your IT. Okay. Well, and I, this last slide just has some tips that you wanted to throw in, and I think they address some of the questions that, um, that people have asked too, so I want to Go through those quick, Joe. Sure. PC ventilation. Like I said earlier, things heat up. They need to breathe. They need to stay cool to run optimum. Um, backup critical data. That was something I mentioned earlier. That if you if you can do nothing else um, with your machine, uh, at least back up your data. Back up the stuff that you need. Um, and if you have to, like it says in the next bullet, use external hard drives if needed. Get an external hard drive from wherever, Best Buy, Costco, wherever. Every now and then, plug that in. All the work that you've done that you need, you want to save, put that on there. If it's stuff that you um, periodically change and update, make sure that the most updated version of it is on your external hard drive. Listen to your PC. And what I mean by that is you'll get to know it. Um, if it's suddenly rubbing way up, like I mentioned earlier, your fan's rubbing way up, You've got a problem with um, your heat dis um, dispersion. It could be just simply it needs a good cleaning. Uh, that that is most likely the idea, the, the uh, problem actually. Um, if your computer's sitting down on the ground, on the floor, it collects more dust than it would if it was up on the desk. It collects dust, it gathers up in the in the in the fins of the um, heat sinks. Therefore, it cannot cool off more uh, as efficient as it should. So you need to get that cleared out. Um, and clicking noises. If your hard drive suddenly is you're hearing it making like uh, supersonic Morse code, if it's starting to do that, your hard drive may be on its way out. Sometimes hard drives just make noises. And so it's kind of hard to tell there, but that comes back to where back up your critical data so that if it is starting on its way out, you'll at least have your critical data. Um, we had a couple of questions, Joe, a couple of questions about the dust, so I'll just throw them in here. Is there any way to keep it? From collecting, keep keep the desk Location down. Location is the best is the best thing. Um, really, no, there isn't. The only thing okay. you can do is is try and locate it in an area where you'll minimize uh, it coming in. And someone said they had a computer was making a horrible noise. They opened it up and could tell it was a fan, um, but they cleaned it. But they still had the noise. Is there anything more they can do? Um, yeah, if at all possible, replace the fan. What has most likely happened is that the fan itself is going bad. It's just have little. Um, the, most of them don't have bearings anymore, although some of them do. But they'll just—they're old, and the, the parts wear, and they'll start to warble, and so they won't spin um, flat, if you will, and okay. so they start making noises. Great, thank you. Um, do you want me to continue on, or do we need to exit stage left? <laughs> Well, I don't know if you've noticed in the chat, but we've been getting many requests for you to do another webinar for us, so I may be. Wow. <laughs> yeah, people awesome. are. Thank you, guys. Thank yeah, you, Yeah, thank you. This has been great. You have done a great job of explaining a lot of, a lot of things. And again, remember, we're going to send out resources too. Joe has shared some of his favorites, and I have found um, a bunch too. And so we'll share those, and they're on different things like using Task Manager, getting to know the components, basic troubleshooting techniques, that kind of thing. So it'll be this hopefully just kind of inspired you to want to to 
go the next step with all of this. And, um, do, um, I, do I have something to say one thing real quick? I sure, saw a question yep. go by. They asked about the run uh, slash CMD slash IP config. I happen to notice that one. Yep. That is a way if you get into your run um, prompt, and that's if you go start run, uh, that will bring up your run prompt. You type in CMD into that and hit enter, and then type in, you'll get what's uh, called the command line interface. You type in IP config and hit enter. That will give you your IP address. And so if someone is troubleshooting and they need to know what your IP address, what gateway you're going through and so forth, it will tell you those little things if you're talking with somebody uh, in an IT. Okay, great. And screenshots, you have that on there too. And one of the follow-up resources that I found was on just simple steps on how to take a screenshot when you're getting an nice. error message because that yes. can be so handy when you're talking to IT and too. That's, yep, that's exactly why it's there is because okay. we need that information to help troubleshoot. Great. Well, thank you so much, Joe. This has been great. And thank you everyone for the active chat too. Um, we'll be following up. We'll take a look at questions that didn't get answered, and we'll work to make they, sure they get um, answered in the follow-up message too. And we have another one of the EDGE Initiative Benchmark webinars coming up next month, and that one's on assistive technology specifically focused on children with autism and other developmental differences. And we'll hear about Come On In, which is a program at the Skokie Public Library in Illinois. So, um, you'll see an evaluation form as the webinar ends, and we'd love it if you'd take some time to share with us what you thought of this webinar and also your suggestions for future webinars too. We closely look at those, and, and that's helpful information for us. So, well, that was a fast hour. Thank you so much, Joe, and thank you everyone for being here. We'll call it a wrap.